Welcome to this NHK session. I'm Kenji Kono, the moderator here today. Our topic is uh, stakeholder capitalism in the Asian centuries. I know you have heard a lot about the stakeholder capitalism uh, this week in Davos. It has gotten a lot of attention <laughs> suddenly this year. And uh, we want to discuss uh, how this concept bring to uh, what this concept bring to the Asian economy, which is fast growing economy, and what is needed to help it to take root in the uh, Asian region. And some people say that Asian people have some uh, special affinity to that concept because of the, like in the traditional perception that people and business uh, have to work hand in hand. Now, to discuss these issues, we have excellent <coughs> panelists here. Uh, let me introduce uh, to my immediate left, uh, Che uh, Tawun. He's the chairman of SK Group, which is the leading uh, conglomerate in South Korea. And Laura Cha, she's the first chairwoman to serve as the chair of uh, HKEX, Hong Kong Exchange and Clearings. And Mr. Fumio Kokubu, he is a um, chairman of Marubeni. This is one of the largest um, Sogo Shosha in Japan, which means a trade and investment uh, conglomerate. And the company was established uh, more than 160 years ago. And Professor uh, uh, Joe uh, Stiglitz, of course, you can recognize him. He's well known. He's a, uh, a Nobel Prize economist and also the professor at Columbia University. And he has written a lot about the issues related to uh, uh, income inequality and also the need to reform this capital, capitalist system. Um, Laura Cha, uh, yes. I'm sure your company is encouraging the others yes. uh, to take the same uh, approach, yes. right? Yes, I think um, if I could just step back a bit and then compare the shareholder capitalism with the stakeholder capitalism. I think for many decades, we were the focus of the corporate world, whether it's in Asia or the rest, uh, all compared with the profitability. Mm -hmm. Your responsibility of a company is to the shareholders. So you want to maximize your profit. And it's a very linear and uh, a bilateral relationship. Whereas when we talk about stakeholder capitalism, which has been evolved in the last uh, decade, I would say has become more prominent in the last few years, it is a much more um, a complex relationship between the company and the community. It is multilateral. Uh, if we put the company in the center, then you know the poke that go out, um, the your customer, your uh, of course you're still your shareholder, your <coughs> customer, your supplier, your employees, and the community at large. Mm. So what is the company's responsibility is no longer just to maximize profit. Mm -hmm. For HKEX as an exchange, we have two roles. One is that we are a market operator and we are a regulator. We can help to promote the benefit uh, or rather the importance of stakeholder capitalism by requiring more disclosure of listed companies on our market. And that, you know, one, number one is to raise the awareness. And secondly, we turned some of the guidelines into rules so that the companies have to pay attention <coughs> and have to explain uh, what they are doing or why they are doing certain things. Mm -hmm. In other words, be responsible and be transparent. And then we as a listed company ourselves, we are leading by example as well. Mm -hmm. So we have our ESG principle, we have our CSR committee that uh, very actively not only just preach, but we practice what You're we You're practicing preach. already. Great. Uh, Kukubu-san, uh, in the past, Japanese business people have kind of, kind of embraced the philosophy of uh, Sampo Yoshi. Uh, do you know, anybody know Sampo Yoshi? Non-Japanese audience, I, I explain. That could be translated into like a three-way satisfaction. Good for uh, sellers, good for buyers, and good for the society as a whole. This is the one of all uh, traditional uh, thinking in the business world. Now with this, uh, do you think that makes Japanese um, 
that makes a stakeholder capitalism is it, like a natu natural fit for yeah. the Japanese company. I think, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just the affinity between the two concepts, I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, whatever you call it, I mean, you know, the three-way satisfaction, I mean, yes. <coughs> Um, I think that basically in Japan, uh, uh, we have a culture or philosophy uh, which uh, um, everybody, uh, nation, uh, this, uh, the states and community and the society and the people at large must coexist in harmony. I think coexist in harmony is, is, is very key, I think. And, mm -hmm. uh, that's why, probably the reason why that um, uh, Japan has um, a less uh, Problem we face uh, on the uh, like uh, a social frustration caused by a uh, unequal um, distribution of wealth or the widening spread of the uh, income between the uh, uh, poor and rich. And also, I'd like to say that the in Japan uh, there are many I don't know how many but many many uh, Japanese companies uh, which has a uh, long history over the uh, 100 history and mm -hmm. probably because of that I think so. Uh, this concept of the philosophy is definitely aligned mm -hmm. with the um, stakeholders, uh, the capitalism, I think. Sounds good. Uh, Professor Stiglitz, you've been a very vocal critic of the shareholders capitalism, which is current uh, capitalism. What's the biggest problem with this current shareholder first attitude? Well, I, I think you see it most dramatically uh, in the United States, and that's why there's a push against it. Uh, if you think about the crises the United States is fi facing, we have a health crisis with life expectancy actually going down with an opioid crisis. Uh, we have an inequality crisis, uh, uh, great disparities, uh, deaths of despair, people having no opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, Globally, mm -hmm. but also in the United States, uh, climate change is affecting mm -hmm. uh, everybody. Um, and then you see the role that the corporations have played uh, promoting the opioids, even though they knew they were addictive, mm -hmm. uh, but telling them they weren't. Mm -hmm. uh, childhood diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, promoting food that was really bad for them. Profits went up. It, it was uh, shareholders were good. But our society was 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 destroyed. The diesel gate, uh, where car companies uh, lied about, you know, d devised ways of de deception about how much uh, pollution they were contributing. Mm -hmm. uh, we all will suffer as a result. So you saw time and time again, and the, of course the financial crisis, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, that shareholder value maximization mm -hmm. was coming at the expense. Mm -hmm. of our society as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so it's clear that there has to be a change. And mm -hmm. so you know, that's why, like in my book, uh, People, Power, and Profits, right. I've argued for another kind of capitalism, a progressive mm -hmm. capitalism, a kind of uh, recognizing mm -hmm. the, the role of all the mm -hmm. stakeholders and just wanted to flesh it out. It includes your employees. Mm -hmm. It includes uh, your, your customers. Um, includes the community in which you operate, and includes our planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you don't include all of these, it won't be sustainable. Right, that's interesting. He, he, you mentioned quite a lot of crises in, in what the uh, corporation, some corporation did something terrible. But now, let me focus on then how corporation can work to make the stakeholder uh, much, much better. And I'm sure you mentioned that you've been working on that. Uh, can you tell us more about what you're doing in your company? Yes. <clears throat> the first step is uh, the measurement. The ESG value we're talking about, but uh, well, to make or the, to improve that, that ESG value, we have to measure and, uh, uh, and also the method of accounting. So I started at the, uh, 2014, so I um, forming uh, some of the our social enterprise partners, and each partner has a, they are focused on the uh, certain social value. So we made uh, some task force for accounting uh, assistant. So consult each. 200 different uh, social value and uh, social enterprise. So we get to know how to measure that each value. Then with those knowledges, 
uh, we dare to challenge it, uh, uh, double bottom line accounting. Uh, and uh, 2018, we did it, and uh, we announced that uh, uh, double bottom line uh, approach. That means is uh, including about uh, uh, every dollar of the, our operating profit, we generate about uh, the 53 cents of uh, social value. So in a whole, mm -hmm. so 16 different subsidiary announced that the publicly how much uh, the, social, the social value as the ESG value mm -hmm. uh, to generate in year 2018. And the reason one I'm doing this is uh, one thing is uh, we have to know that the, our stakeholder, not as a group, but as an individual, mm -hmm. so current digital technology can make happen without that much that transaction cost. So uh, you have to get to know that the, who the uh, stakeholders and the, what they really want. And, uh, and secondly, as, uh, uh, not for the, actually the, the measurement itself is uh, not for the just the accuracy, but for the, the improvement. And year by year improvement mm -hmm. is uh, more, much more the important things. And uh, if you think about our current accounting systems, and 100 years ago, so it doesn't have that, that much accuracy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. compared to uh, mm -hmm. these days. Third is uh, uh, we using that uh, this measurement uh, of the ESG value as uh, the monetary uh, terms. Well, you can have you can actually measure that differently, but uh, trying to execute this value. So I, I might need that to uh, understand the cost and the benefit. The only way is uh, well, it it turned out to be that uh, that's a uh, we have to using the uh, dollar terms. So the, right now, company can actually calculate that the, well, if you put in that the you uh, uh, the resources and which way then actually how much value total value financial value and ESG value. So we can actually calculate that way. Uh, so our behavior is changing, not as, as to just make the money flow, mm -hmm. but also uh, we are care, really careful that the stakeholder, mm -hmm. uh, the be benefits. Mm -hmm. What's the reaction of your shareholders? Shareholders, well, as I told you, that we changed the uh, article of incorporation. So they basically, they agree upon, and we, uh, time to time, we actually check again and again, and we explain. And uh, mostly uh, the long-term uh, investment investors, they love. Mm -hmm. I get, I guess that the, I don't quite understand that the short-term uh, the investors and they might not like it. Mm -hmm. But even they only uh, focus on the uh, the shareholder uh, the the share price. So as long as we keep the, uh, the share price, so uh, it don't, yeah, well, I don't have any complaint from the, uh, the shareholders. And uh, we also invest, yes, shareholder is uh, one of the important uh, stakeholders. So uh, we keep communicate with them and uh, uh, we try to reflect that their the, uh, desires and uh, needs. Sounds good. Kokubo-san, what's your situation in at <coughs> Well. The, the ESG or SDGs are core, uh, the, the, I would say, that, uh, the principle mm -hmm. on our uh, management uh, strategy. And um, so, you know, we have been doing uh, the, 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 the many things on, not only on the business, you know, the space, but on the uh, social uh, space as well. Mm -hmm. Like a social space, I mean, we have uh, Malbeni Foundation, uh, which has a more than 40 years of history, uh, really focused on the welfare. And other than that, we um, uh, uh, many things uh, proactively touching on that space as well. And on the business side, uh, I'll tell you one example that two years ago, uh, we um, addressed the statement uh, that um, uh, we will not touch a, a new um, uh, coal burning uh, the power, power, power generation <coughs> project anymore. That was uh, two years ago. 
And uh, also, we um, did declare that uh, we'll um, divest uh, at least 50% of the, uh, uh, the current asset uh, by the year of the 2030. Although the, uh, the, the, the power business is the, uh, one of the core business for us, but so, so we, we, we did it. Well, in short, I mean, I think it's kind of what um, uh, we would like to, uh, to do is uh, to run the company, operate the company in well, um, um, the, the balanced, uh, uh, the managed uh, approach, uh, taking into cons cons consideration all these stakeholders, not only uh, the, the, the focusing on uh, short term uh, the profit in the interest of the uh, shareholders and uh, uh, short term investors. Uh, of course, this strategy uh, is not appreciated by everybody, mm -hmm. and uh, especially you know the people like uh, short term investors or activists. Or, uh, but I, I believe that uh, for us, by doing that, uh, definitely we can raise or increase our uh, the the uh, corporate value mm -hmm. on a long term basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Professor Stiglitz, what's your take on their efforts on, on the corporation side? But the, you remember that the U.S. Business Roundtable, which is the group of business uh, people in, in the state, they pledged that they're going to reform the way and uh, change the uh, uh, state shareholder first uh, orthodoxy. And do you think that corporation can do it? I mean, this is like a still rhetorical things and it's not genuine. Well, I, th I think they can do it, and we've had some examples here of showing how you may have to change your articles of, of, of cor incorporation. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to change your mindsets. Uh, you have to, I think one of the things that was important, you have to have systems of accountability. It's not just saying to the CEO, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You have, uh, you know, the nice thing about uh, the financial uh, returns is you have a system of accountability, but that's why it was important what SK did mm -hmm. is to have a, a, a way of uh, checking that the company is actually doing mm -hmm. what it says it's doing in environment and, and uh, uh, social uh, in, in all these areas. Um, I would say that right now it, uh, in the United States, it's uh, Partly rhetorical. Rhetorical. Uh, I think if they say it often enough, maybe they'll believe it, and maybe that will affect uh, their behavior. But I'd say, you know, three things, uh, two or three things that are absolutely essential if they're going to, to use the expression, if they're going to uh, walk the talk. Uh, the first thing is the first element of corporate responsibility is paying your taxes. Uh, and if you're not contributing to your society by paying your fair share of taxes, mm -hmm. you're, you're not corporate, uh, corporate responsible. And, you know, we have some companies that have gotten a lot of attention, like Apple, uh, paying 0.2% of their profits, or was it 0.02, I can't remember, but in Ireland as a way of escaping their social responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, no matter what the CEO says, mm -hmm. You have to ask, are they sincere? Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, the second element is paying a livable wage. Mm -hmm. You know, if you pay your worker uh, the minimum wage or even twice the minimum wage, mm -hmm. they can't live. Mm -hmm. It's well below a livable wage. And that, of course, is, is max on the other side mm -hmm. about what fraction of the corporate revenue goes to the top management and to the CEO. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an area where I think there is a difference between the Asian values and, and what we've had in mm -hmm. uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the numbers that people look at is what is the ratio of, say, CEO pay to uh, the typical worker, or the median worker. Mm -hmm. And, and the kind of numbers you hear is that in Japan, it's like 10 to 1. Yeah, yeah. And in Europe, it's 30 to 1. Mm -hmm. And the United States, it's somewhere between 300 to 1 to 1,000 to 1. <laughs> and it's not because American CEOs are that much more productive. Mm -hmm. You know, they may be very good, but I think you probably think <laughs> that you're pretty good. Um, they're not 10 times better or 30 yeah, times right. better we're, than you. We're not that bad. <laughs> they're not that bad. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's uh, greed. Not, so if we start seeing a, a, a movement towards 
limiting CEO pay, mm -hmm. paying their taxes, mm -hmm. raising the wages at the bottom to a, a basic livable wage, mm -hmm. then I will really say they're on track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, yeah. Do you have the same uh, uh, problem of the high paying for the CEO in, in Asia? Well, I think it's um, uh, their pockets and it, different, it differs in different industry. But my own view is that um, it's very hard to put a ratio for the government or, or you know, a regulator to say that it has to be X to X. I think that's more a social and uh, investor community that will create that pressure. My view about government's role is that definitely, like Joe said, there are certain things that the government can do in the sphere of stakeholder capitalism. The government can set minimum standards. Minimum wage is one, but the company should pay living wage and not just the minimum wage. The government set the minimum. And the other uh, area that comes to mind, emission control, waste disposal, waste treatment, water treatment, all these that are good for the community. The companies cannot do it on their own. And so the government's role in stakeholder uh, uh, capitalism is to provide, provide certain minimum, or I wouldn't say minimum, certain standards, yes. certain requirements that companies have to comply. And that goes towards the good for the welfare of the community. Mm -hmm. And then the government, with these, then the companies are expected certainly, uh, to follow. And as a regulator and as the exchange, we have the responsibility also to ensure <coughs> that these are followed, the requirements are followed. Therefore, we want to have enhanced corporate governance, enhanced disclosure. The, go the company has to explain, um, not only on the social side, but let's say on the diversity side. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, women on board, women in senior management is a big issue and what are companies doing, inclusivity, it's not just the women but different culture. So, you know, stakeholder capitalism goes beyond just the profit making. I think the community as a whole, each has a role to play. Mm -hmm. And of course, with the company in the center, without losing the objective of making money, we can't expect companies to not make a profit, but with all, we have to take into all of these into account. I see. Well, the government role, we're going to talk about it later yeah. uh, this discussion, but uh, Ms. Chad, I want to ask you, uh, because uh, your companies here are already working on the stakeholder uh, mm -hmm. capitalism, but not many, I mean, other Asian right. companies or Asian yeah. nations, they are not, haven't done yet. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how you can uh, uh, help them mm -hmm. to implement it. I think, you know, if we talk about Asian economy, the one um, historical and cultural uh, characteristic is that we have many family-owned business, and some of them are state-owned businesses. So you have one dominant, uh, dominant shareholder. Um, in the last 20-some years, um, different jurisdiction has tried to uh, enhance the corporate governance requirements so that the shareholders are treated equally and fairly. Mm. So I think the fairness treatment, fair, fair treatment is one way. And then now we are pushing the, um, the envelope further, not only just the corporate governments, but the corporate responsibility beyond just making a profit. And I think in Asia, um, I, I do not believe that there is any difference in attitude. Uh, companies are catching up. Um, the younger generations in Asia whether it's an investor generation or the consumer generation, are ex have this universal desire. Uh, I don't see the difference between what is required, what should be required of Asian company and the West. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, you know, we started a little late, but I see the equal momentum, like SK Group, they are already doing a lot. So we need to make it much more uh, urgent as, a, as, a, as an agenda item mm -hmm. and uh, to push it further down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the issue of like a corruption or nepotism or mm -hmm. you know those basic things well, that you see in, in Asian uh, that all That's not limited to Asian com companies. I think um, the nepotism, cronyism, these are um, issues that corporate governance try to address. The uh, uh, governance code and transparency, accountability. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the investors that would hold these responsible. And of course, government's role is to 
you know, it, it, it's kind of ironic, but the government has a role in stamping out the corruption as well mm -hmm. by bringing in very strong um, measures of anti-corruption. Certainly in the financial sector, we have seen the any money laundering and uh, corruption mm -hmm. prevention uh, has come in in a very big way. Mm -hmm. And that is from government and regulators' mm -hmm. uh, demand. Mm -hmm. So I, I would see that gradually uh, spill over to other industries as well. I see. The Kokuru-san, is there any advice that you can make uh, to Western business uh, people uh, except for this high income? Well, I mean, <laughs> probably I, 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 I the emphasize uh, good good aspect of the Japanese, you know, the, the, the business uh, uh, that may be too much. But I think I have to, you know, before that, I have to uh, accept that uh, the, the, if you're looking at uh, the Japanese companies uh, from the uh, perspective of the, uh, the uh, global standard, I think it's in average, except a few, uh, still behind, I think, in terms of the productivity, uh, uh, especially on the service sector, uh, or, or uh, management efficiency, and, um, and um, uh, the, the biggest challenge we face now is that how we can Glob or the capture the the growth. I mean, on the robust growth, and so that the the the, the what we have to do is that um, uh, keep uh, working on the, the catching on the uh, you know the, the global standard uh -huh. while we maintain our good DNA. Mm -hmm. So that that's 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 the balance we have to you know I see. take, and uh, while well, same thing you know I like have to the the uh, see the same thing happen to the Western you know business world. I see. Mr. Chair, how about you? you? Any advice that you can make for the Western business people? Uh, advice? Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't think that I have a position to advise anybody. Uh, but uh, what I'm trying to do is uh, we need more uh, test if we really uh, want to have that uh, stakeholder capitalism. So uh, uh, we have to define the who's the real s uh, stakeholder and uh, uh, what really they want and uh, actually the bottom line. So based on that, so even the CEO is uh, evaluating not just at the uh, money only, but also the how much actually the, they make the ESG value. Mm -hmm. So once we doing that, actually, well, we had that the much more the uh, uh, the fair value to the uh, see all the CEOs and uh, other companies uh, they generate that some uh, value as a as a whole. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the okay. That's can, I, can I suggest yeah, one sure. one yeah. thing? Uh, you know, uh, was described how uh, uh, they man SK managed to change ex articles uh, of. Uh, 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 um, incorporation. Uh, what are the problems in the United States uh, has been the legal framework mm -hmm. and that beginning about uh, 40 years uh, or go, so ago, uh, Milton Friedman pushed this idea that the only purpose of the firm was to maximize shareholder value and that got incorporated in the legal framework in the United States. I should, you know, it's very clear it was not based on economic science. Mm. Uh, I had already explained in some articles I had written that shareholder value maximization did not lead to societal well-being. Mm -hmm. But it was an ideological uh, perspective, uh, particularly of the right, and they pushed it. And it's in the legal framework in the United States. So you have um, uh, endowments, pension funds, having a uh, legal obligation to maximize shareholder value, and that's interpreted typically as short-term mm -hmm. value. And the result of that is you get this short-termism, you get ignoring the social consequences, the environmental consequences. So I think one of the important lessons is that you have to create a legal framework mm -hmm. that encourages innovation in the way companies operate, mm -hmm. and at least give them the chance to be socially responsible. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I would go further and make it a, more of an obligation mm -hmm. for them mm -hmm. 
to be uh, to to look at all the stakeholders. I see. Probably this is the right time to talk about more on the government role, as you mentioned there. Uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Stiglitz, how far do you think governments should go to, uh, to solve this issue? Well, I, I think uh, they have a very important uh, role to play, and uh, Laura pointed this out uh, uh, before. Um, you know, the corporations can go a long way, mm -hmm. but you have competitions between different companies, and unfortunately, you're going to have some companies that may not behave well. Uh, you know, like we've been having uh, actually two years ago in Davos, I was a panel with one of the soft drink companies that talked about how they wanted not to, to, to do something about the childhood diabetes problem that the sugar-rich drinks were doing. But their competitors were uh, making more money by having these uh, uh, soft drinks that children love. So you have to have a regulatory framework that says, you know, you can't try to get children addicted to these foods that lead to childhood diabetes. So you have to have a legal framework that says there are certain things you can't do that are so destructive uh, to society. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's, that's absolutely uh, essential. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about having uh, a minimum wage, and I think the minimum wage has to be much higher, but then the corporations have to have the flexibility in different communities, uh, the cost of living is different. So their mindset should be, what is a livable wage? Mm -hmm. You know, if they start thinking about their workers and say, in the United States, the minimum wage is $7.25. Uh, you know, that's $15,000. You can't pay your rent. Uh, for fifth, for for that uh, in New York City, mm -hmm. so if the employer started saying, "Could I live and support a family on fifteen thousand dollars a year?" the answer is obviously you're you're in deep poverty. Right. And as a corporation, do I want my workers mm -hmm. in that kind of poverty, working full time? Uh, the answer is not not if you're uh, a responsible employer. Mm -hmm. So you think the government should be more involved in the maker framework? Uh, has to has to be more involved because the nature of of, of the market is there is a certain element of competition, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, if you don't have the right legal framework, there'll be a race to the bottom, mm -hmm. and that's what we've been seeing in in lots of aspects of American capitalism. Mm -hmm. What's your Kokubu-san, what's your response to that, uh, his argument? Well, I, I, I think it's, this is it's kind of the just a matter of um, the, how you um, uh, the distribute the, the, the wealth, I think. Well, I, I don't know. The, 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 to me, it's, um, uh, the, the government uh, has to um, uh, build the framework uh, on two things, I think. One of those is to, um, uh, to, uh, to make a rule to ensure uh, the the fair market to prevent uh, like uh, rentier you know the economy of rentier market I would say and uh, next thing is the appropriate uh, the build the framework uh, on the wealth distribution and um, in that aspect I think I, I would say that the Japan um, Japanese government is doing doing pretty good and maybe too good. <laughs> so, so I think it's a two major thing, you know, I, I'm coming up with the... Uh, uh -huh. Mr. Jay, what do you think the government should take lead or the corporation should take lead? Well, I don't mind. And, uh, well, I actually agree upon the, uh, the Professor Stiglitz and, yeah, government has that there was some legal framework. But based on that, uh, well, the corporate has to have it their own best. That's the uh, that's the how it works. But I suggest that the one other things, actually, usually government are pushing that a lot of uh, the penalty system. But uh, in order to boosting that uh, ESG value, so uh, change corporate behavior as an incentive system is uh, well sometimes much more the, uh, effective. So. Uh, what SK trying to do is uh, uh, 
uh, we, I already told you that 220 different uh, uh, social enterprise partners to measure that the ESG value. But there is a, one other uh, the pilot uh, test. Actually, with those measurements and annually, we checked the value uh, each one uh, social enterprise generated the social value. Then actually, SK, my company, forming that the, some, uh, the fund to uh, the matching with the, uh, the ESG value, actually as a kind of incentive, positive incentive. Right now is about 25% uh, of uh, the social uh, value they generate and we matching as a cash. So we give them to uh, the cash. Mm. So uh, it's a kind of pilot test. Uh, we wanted to hit the collect the data and how actually this incentive system changed their behavior and uh, uh, society. And I think it's too early to talk about. It's only the five years. Uh, we've been doing this five years, but we collected some data, but it's not enough. So this incentive system is really works for uh, everybody. I don't know yet. So it's a limited uh, the pilot test. But once we had that, uh, enough data, then actually well, we could suggest that the, uh, not only just that the negative things and the, the, this is a positive incentive system may yeah, boost that uh, we can actually make the what's they call the uh, capitalism. So, so you don't need the help of the government in that sense? Uh, no, actually, uh, when we finish this, this incentive system, it really works. And we're going to actually propose to government mm -hmm. where the society has to adopt it, the, well, these systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another government role, I guess. But uh, right now, as the government always said, uh, they cannot actually make the, well, this kind of test. So uh, actually incorporated uh, our own roles and uh, as a kind of a CSR activity. Mm. Interesting. Uh, Professor, uh, what do you think is this a corporation that should take lead or government should take lead in, in for the stakeholder? Uh, they both have to be working together. I don't think you can say priority. The, the government sets the framework. Mm. The actual actions are going to occur at the level of the corporation. Mm. And uh, you want the corporation to go beyond the minimum. I think that's what, you know, that, that they ought to be striving. Uh, and I think when we think about it, we want to think about both the negative and the positive, right. saying that you should do no harm. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't engage in exploitation. You should, your profits shouldn't be taking advantage of the vulnerable, uh, shouldn't be using you know, extremes of market power to, to hurt other people. So that's, you know, do no harm kind of thing. And a lot of the profits in the United States came out of exploitation. The rentier economy is, mm -hmm. is what, and that doesn't make for a vibrant mm -hmm. uh, uh, economy. Mm -hmm. And then on the positive side, um, I think that there is uh, an obligation uh, uh, of corporations to think about how do they create a better society, a uh, better, uh, you know, treat the environment well. That's a positive, uh, uh, but also, promote other social values like diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, the government can set the framework mm -hmm. and it may have to be stronger in some societies than others. Uh, you know, 40% of the women uh, of the board should be women. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have to regulate it, but we look at where we are mm -hmm. and you say, well, we need a little bit of a push mm -hmm. and eventually we won't have to do it because I'll discover that uh, it actually adds mm -hmm. to the board. But right now, I think there's a need of a, a little government push right. uh, in these areas. I see. But I would say that probably like an extreme form of government uh, involvement is probably like a state uh, capitalism that you will see in, in China, for example. And Mr. Cha, you know a lot about the Chinese uh, economic system. Do you think that state capitalism can work like as uh, state uh, holder capitalism can do? I mean, like a similar role in, in for society? Um, I think it's a, this is, when we talk about state capitalism and when we think about state-owned enterprises and using China as an example, it actually has a very interesting journey. 20 years ago, when the state-owned enterprises came to list in Hong Kong, 
And what do we do? We look at the state enterprises. It is a mini community in itself. Mm -hmm. The company, not only if it is a steel company, a petrochemical or whatever, they has the production, but they also take care of its employees from cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. They have childcare, they have hospital, they have schools, and they have elderly care, they have the entire work. And that is the state-owned enterprise. And in the process of listing, we said, those are not your core responsibility. Your responsibility, the company's uh, uh, core objective is to produce steel or whatever mm -hmm. is your business. And so you should divest all of those into another entity or you know, it should not be the, the core part. And so you see the state-owned enterprise, the state capitalism, if one could call it, is taking care of your entire community. It's not just the employee, but the family and so on. Then we said, well, you know, you should, those are taking away your attention. You should focus on making profit and making sure that you are an efficient uh, enterprise. Uh, so they divest away from that. At the same time, after they divest all of that, they list as a listed company, and we look at them and then these are state-owned enterprises. So the majority of these companies' shareholder is the state. But from the state's point of view, the government's point of view, who is representing the state? Mm -hmm. So they appoint the directors. So the directors feel that they are responsible to the management. They are they the management. The board of directors are appointed by the state, by different ministry. But the state, in the sense of the government, feel that no one actually is representing them, their interests. So it is a very interesting journey that we have seen in China. But more broadly, when we talk about state capitalism, is the state that given certain incentive and subsidies mm -hmm. to companies to enable them to compete in a market where they have added advantage. Mm. And I think that is becoming less and less acceptable in, in society today. Um, State-owned enterprises, at least those are listed in Hong Kong, are treated like any other listed companies, and they have to disclose the same kind of um, their you know, income and their various expenditure in the same way. Uh, so gradually, the state-owned enterprises, at least those that are listed, are behaving more and more like a commercial enterprise. Mm -hmm. So that we've seen the journey from Hong Kong's perspective, We've seen that journey. Journey. So, but the state capitalism worked in one level yeah. of, uh, or one phase of the development yes. as a stakeholder. Capitalism. Yeah, as a stakeholder, you can say that they have a, a role to play. And the, where I think there is a like, the divergence of interest is whether the state is the employer mm. or the company that want to maximize the profit. So I think in each case, and the, I would say by and large, the state-owned enterprises are behaving certainly more commercially uh, like the other companies. Mm -hmm. Professor Stiglitz, what's your take on uh, state capitalism? Well, I, I think uh, the journey that was just described is a very interesting one because in some ways they began much more like stakeholder uh, firms. Uh, they worried about their workers, uh, and then they were told, don't worry about your workers so much. Uh, focus on profits. Uh, you know, of course, the profits go to the government, and that could be used <clears throat> to advance other, other social objectives. Um, but in fact, uh, and I think the point was an important one, uh, the governance of these institutions is not really done by the state mm -hmm. uh, for society as a whole. And that's one of the reasons why we, uh, in, in the West, there's a lot of emphasis on decentralization, on a market economy, because you get more voices uh, into, into how this operates. So to me, the big issue in, in some ways is this issue of governance, accountability, uh, decentralization, uh, uh, a level playing field, and, and this is particularly important, uh, allowing new enterprises to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's a decentralization 
not only of economic power, but also of political power. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason in the United States uh, 150 years ago we began uh, the antitrust laws about concentration of economic power uh, to break it up was to create a more dynamic, competitive economy. Mm -hmm. And in the case of China, they were moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. There was a lot new private enterprises coming in. And when there's private competing with the public, I think you can get that, what we call a dynamic ecology uh, with a right legal framework. And now some of the worry is that the space for the private sector may be diminished and the playing field is less level than it used to be. And uh, that's a problem. Uh, so if we, you know, as one kind of institution competing with other kinds of institutions, that's fine. Just like we have uh, cooperatives that are an important institution uh, in our society. Uh, our universities are uh, not, for the most part, profit making. Uh, uh, we can have a diversity of institutional arrangements. I think that's fine. But when you uh, stifle mm -hmm. uh, the ability of new enterprises to come in, that's when I get worried. Mm, I see. Ms. Jai, what's your reaction to his re worry? Uh, I would agree with uh, Joe. I think, uh, you know, the state, and if it is using its power to crowd out the space for the private enterprise, then it go back to the you know, antitrust cases in the United States where the companies, not the government, the companies get to be too big, the monopoly, and then you know, it, is, it has an unfair uh, sphere of influence on the market as a whole. And, I and think on that, democracy. You know, and, on, <laughs> right. and I think in, in general, uh, I think competition is good. Uh, we've seen, you know, uh, cases after cases where an industry where there's not enough competition, it's the one who suffer, the ones who suffer are, are the consumers. So when we talk about capitalism, it really, um, the, whether it's stakeholder or shareholder, we have to identify who are the people that are being affected. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the shareholder capitalism, we only think about the shareholder, the investor. But in the stakeholder, there are so many different elements. Mm -hmm. And if the government's if the government is using its power and influence to really suffocate some part of the business, then I think you know when the it comes back that the stakeholder capitalism is not working. It becomes dominated by a certain sector. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stewart, you mentioned that uh, mm -hmm. democracy is democracy is important in, for the stakeholder capitalism, not the state capitalism. Well, that goes to, you, you might say, my <laughs> broader sense of values. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, we, we begin, begin in, uh, the discussion is what, what is the objective of the economy? And are we supposed to serve the economy? Is the economy supposed to serve us? Mm -hmm. what, are our, what do we care about? And, and we care about, obviously, uh, material goods. But we care about a lot of other things. We care about our environment. We care about uh, allowing people to, to flourish as individuals. Uh, and part of one of the important things that people care about is voice, that they are being heard, that, that, uh, and they're heard within the corporation, but also within our society. And that's what democracy is about. Uh, and uh, so we have to keep. I think this broader perspective of what are we trying to achieve, mm -hmm. and it's not just maximizing GDP, mm -hmm. it's maximizing well-being in a very broad sense. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really, uh, we, we want to measure that at, at, at the level of the society, mm -hmm. and that's what we, we want to measure that at the level of the corporation, and that's the kind of ESG kind of things that, that uh, uh, yeah. good corporations mm -hmm. uh, are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Now, let me uh, uh, focus uh, in the future. And there are a growing concern that the artificial intelligence, AI and robotics are going to replace or, uh, human workers. And I wonder what uh, stakeholder cap capitalism can be achieved in, in this disruptive era of uh, uh, 
uh, change, um, mm -hmm. Mr. Chay. Yes, people worry about some uh, technological changes, and uh, uh, this technology has evolved too fast, and it affected a lot of uh, society uh, and the peoples. But uh, actually, the problem is the directions. A directionless AI is a really danger. Because that well, we only focus on the money. But if we put in the other directions, like uh, well, equal uh, the value between that the ESG and uh, also uh, the financial value, then actually the AI has the right directions, and they actually protected the, uh, some, yeah. Our the environmental values and social value and governance also, and so it's a kind of tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a, well some hammers and well what are you gonna use that well, this hammer to uh, for? So that's a, <clears throat> that's my uh, perception. So mm -hmm. so using AI. So one example is uh, how, well actually our, one of our, our subsidiary is uh, making the AI speakers. And uh, usually they for good for the, uh, listening to music and those things. But uh, we, as long as that we put it in the well, social value in it, then people think a little bit differently. So uh, care for the elderly. So the elder people has don't have actually the uh, a whole day. They don't have actually a talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. Then he, this AI speaker is uh, monitoring uh, uh, the, his health and the security. Because the well, if he not speak to the, the uh, speakers in certain time, then it's a kind of alarm. Mm -hmm. And then it's a normal uh, situation, and uh, the elderly people speaks to actually to the speakers, whatever whatever they want. Sometimes it's a, this speaker is not perfect and uh, will uh, answer back to uh, uh, wrong things, but I don't understand what, what he's saying. But anyhow, that uh, the elderly people is talked to, that actually prevented the, uh, some Alzheimer. So I bring that to some of the, uh, the ventures. How actually uh, measuring the target and the normal target and the different target to using the, the, this AI speaker to prevent the, the, uh, the, AI, the Alzheimer's. Mm. So actually this, uh, when you make the, some direction to the right way, mm. it could actually help and the creek drops. Mm -hmm. mm. So it's a matter of the, how you're using that, the, your tools. Uh, that's, that's, that's my yeah. perception. Well, that's interesting. Uh, Kukubusa, uh, do you have any way well, to... Well, I think it's... Um, the, the social revolution led by the AI or the new technology, I mean, digitalization, is, I, I think, will become more capital intensive mm. and uh, as well as uh, probably uh, technology intensive. Mm. And then the, I'm afraid to say that, like you said, I, I mean, um, I, I'm sure that, that this is not really the positive on employment. Uh, and then this is the biggest challenge we face, I think, from, you know, the, the um, uh, at least uh, I mean, the very near future, I think. And um, I, um, my concern is that the for our case, I think at least maybe 10% job uh, will be um, replaced by the AI or uh, the new technology. And so that the question is, the challenge is, do you think you can create a new business model mm -hmm. uh, to generate the, um, uh, the, the, the opportunity for the, yeah. the employment, I think? That's a, that's a challenge, I think. I see. Yeah. You have anything to add? Well, um, I think uh, the disruption caused by technology could be, you know, in a, in, in a good way, like um, uh, the SK Group has, has done. There are methods and new products that have been created for the welfare of the society. But for the corporation itself, in terms of practicing the stakeholder capitalism, a responsible employer should be reskilling and upskilling its staff. Why the company try to use technology to upgrade its own processes, its own operation, which make it more efficient and more, you know, really catch up with the time? The staff that might be displaced should be retooled 
reskilled mm -hmm. and upskilled. Mm -hmm. I think those are the way to make that you're being a responsible employer to your employees who are one of your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it also creates stability in the workforce. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I think it's good for the company and good for the community. Mm -hmm. Can I just add, uh, you know, I, th I think the focus should be on uh, maintain using these new tools uh, for well-being and uh, recognizing the, the challenges they pose. So I think I agree absolutely that you have to play a, a role in helping people facilitate uh, the transition to these new economies, providing them with some element of security because there will be job loss no matter how hard you do, or at least job transition. Um, the other side is, again, back to the do no harm because the AI gives you opportunity for exploitation of a, a discriminatory pricing, uh, invasions of privacy. There, there are lots of uh, new negative opportunities right. that the right. new instruments. And uh, I think uh, stakeholder capitalism says, don't do that. Uh, let's focus on improving the well-being of our society. Let's yeah, keep in that. We're running out of time, so we wrap, to wrap up this, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to e ask each of you uh, to choose a keyword, one keyword that describes your vision for a stakeholder capitalism. Will you give you 30 seconds for each, Mr. Che? Yes, keyword is uh, measurement. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, unless you measure, you cannot manage it. So, mm -hmm. well, it's a joke and uh, uh, we need some actions. Otherwise, as a NATO, uh, no action, talk only. Mm -hmm. so, so without measurement, and I don't think that the world we, had, we, 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 we don't have any first steps uh, to stakeholder capitalism. So well, we have to know that who the stakeholder is and what really they want and how to measure that our, our the value improvement so with, with those things. And uh, I think that we can make the real change. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, I would say responsible, responsible, be a responsible employer, be a responsible um, community leader, be a responsible participant in society. Uh, I mean, that goes to being a responsible to various aspects of the stakeholder capitalism. Great. Good question. Well, uh, uh, the word I uh, come up with is that uh, still the animal spirit. Animal spirit. Yeah. <laughs> and then encourage and respect the animal spirit, but on the same time, control the animal spirit for uh, common good. I see. Interesting. But so I can't get up one word, but I'll get four words uh, <laughs> uh, inclusive, uh, sustainable, accountable, and progressive. Right? This is the right time to wrap up this meeting. Thank you very much. It was great uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you.